So I'm going to talk about sport. I'm going to talk about how sport affects your life, how sports and business are so intertwined, and how sport is very, very important teacher of reaching excellence. And those lessons are very easily available in your day-to-day -day life. So where did it all start? It started here. It started at St. Mary's School. The person you see in the center is the Doyle of Indian Athletics, uh, Jal Padiwala, and, and uh, when he passed away, that's the tribute I wrote to him. Uh, this was the man who changed my life, and that's Mr. J.R.D. Tata, if you recognize him. Uh, I also worked for the Tata Group for 15 years. And uh, that was the slap that changed my life. It was my teacher, my guru, Mr. Padiwala, who taught me about life, about winning, about thinking positive, and that's where it all started. I said I'm going to connect sport to business, and this is something, a very simple diagram which most business institutions will tell you. There's a vision, mission, there are objectives, you have KPIs, and then you do a scan of internal and external environment, formulate a strategy and execute a strategy, you'll have to do programs, activities. It's identical, it's identical for a sportsman. Say you set up your vision to win a medal at the Olympics, so that's your vision. And then you set up your objectives, the short term, you'll have long term objectives. You will have to scan the environment, you'll have to see who are your competitors, you'll have to do an internal scan of seeing what are your strengths, uh, what sort of, uh, what are your internal strengths to understand and what you need to do to reach where you need to reach, they formulate a strategy. And then you'll have to do your programs. What is your training program? In the training program, it will be divided into, say, hill running, weight training, uh, sand running, track running, etc. You'll have different activities, activities during training, activities during competition. You'll need resources, so you'll need, you'll need track, you'll need sports science, sports medicine, um, you will need um, nutrition, and all of that you'll have to get a coach to be put that in place and execute it. So, it's nothing different. So, what are we talking about? We're talking about a vision, an end. And then that brings us, brings us to the discussion of destination end. And I think, I think all you, you people here would think of something like this. I would like to pass out of Pune Engineering College, maybe do a master's at MIT, go to Harvard Business School, and start with a salary of, say, $150,000. I'm sure people like you have that on mind. And, and then that, that brings us to a, a conversation on journey versus destination, path versus the end. So, I understand that most of you people here think that the end is the most important thing. Because end is the driver of ambition. And if we set ourselves result goals, then we want to get there at all cost. And then end gives us the vision. That's what we think. I think is the end which excites most of us, especially when we are young. In sport, we've always had this debate of journey versus destination. And for those who argue that destination is the most important thing, let me assure you that through my experience in sport, it causes a lot of anxiety, it causes turbulence, it adds, is one of the reasons actually, if you notice why top athletes choke, because what happens is that you th keep thinking of the end, you keep thinking of the end result. 
and then pressure starts to build up. So your blood pressure starts going up. You start feeling butterflies in your stomach. Your muscles start tensing. And you start feeling sometimes even uneasy and sick. I, I'm, sure, I'm sure that a lot of you have, have experienced this not only, not only when you're playing a game and choke, but sometimes when you do an examination, sometimes when you go for an interview, so you choke. And, and that is because you're thinking of the end result. Also, when you make that your mission, just winning, just winning at all cost, then that, that actually moves into the area of not understanding or not wanting to understand the path to success. And then you can not go around the right path. And what happens in sport, cheating, doping, in real life, what happens? Bribery, corruption. And this is the fear of keeping on looking at the end result. The other thing we've seen in sport, that athletes who kept chasing money, athletes who kept chasing money, have lost their performance on the way. And I believe the path of excellence is through performance. And I believe that if you have performance, money will follow logically. So my thought process is that if you make the process of achievement supreme, the result will become irrelevant. And the idea is to perfect the process of performance. And don't let the pressure of the end result choke you. So most most top races are won or lost, not because somebody is better than you, but it happens because you didn't run your best race. I'll give you a small example. In 1983, I was running in Europe. That was the first big race I was running. It was in Germany. And everybody drawn into that competition from Carl Lewis to Ben Johnson to Don Quarry, a, a young Carl Lewis to an aging Don Quarry of Jamaica. And I was completely overawed. I ran the worst race of my life, the worst race of my season. And then my coach called me up and said, what did you do? He said, you were trying to run somebody else's race. You were changing your gears too fast and you're engineering students. So if you understand when you change gears too fast, what happens? And I was hitting top speed far before I should have hit it. So I didn't go through the gears because I was watching people running on my right and left. Four days later, we had to run in Koblenz. And uh, he said, all you're going to do is focus on a point, 10 meters, 10 meters beyond the finish line. You will wear blinkers. You will not see right or left. I did exactly that. And the very next day, three days later, I set a new national record. So, so that, is, that is what happens when you, you, look at, uh, you look at other people's races. This is what preparation is all about. So, so I'm coming back to excellence in preparation. And once you do that, set performance goals. So all, all top athletes set performance goals. So I don't go into a race to say, I'm going to win this race. If I'm going to run my 10.0 my seconds, I'm going to repeat that or run better. That's what I'm going to do. If somebody runs 9.6 seconds, he will run faster, he will win. But I need to repeat that 10.0 seconds. And that brings me to another, another point of team teamwork. I don't know how many of you know, but you can Google Brigadier Chandpuri. He was also an international walking judge, a very dear friend. 1971 war, fought back the Pakistan army, uh, lost two soldiers. They had only 120 soldiers against 56 tanks of Pakistan, 2,000 soldiers. Pakistan, I think, lost about 2,000 soldiers and about 50, 60 vehicles. So, so that is what teamwork is all about. And I think the greatest, the greatest example of teamwork I find in the services, 
the Army Navy Air Force. And actually one wonders what these people do during peacetime. But the amount of training they do during peacetime is incredible. Look at Cargill, how they worked as a team. When Cargill happened, what, what did they do? First, the artillery battered the lower slopes. The Air Force went in and battered all the top positions. And then the foot soldiers climbed up and uh, captured Tiger Hill and other locations. Another part of teamwork is you have to trust your teammates. And only then you'll be a successful team. For example, when, when peop people in the army are sleeping, there are few sentries, but their lives of the guys who are sleeping is in the hands of those sentries who are keeping watch. The other thing they do is never, never, never leave their injured or dead behind. They go and retrieve them, even at great danger to themselves. So this is something you must reflect on when you're talking about a team, when you're talking, a team is a fighting machine. And you have to be all in sync with each other. You have to understand each other. You have to literally put your lives in each other's hands. The other thing that I want to emphasize on is whatever you do, if you're training, for every repetition, you must put in at 100%. And the next repetition, you again put in at 100%. And the third repetition, you again put 100%. And, and if you practice that in life, for everything that you do, that, that is what is the difference between good and great. And, and if you give in 100% and still lose, there is no shame in that. There is no shame in that. You sleep well. You've done your 100%. You go home, sleep well. You walk up to the person who's beaten you, shake his hand, congratulate him. Because if you grudge, if you grudge his performance, somebody else is going to grudge yours, and you don't want that to happen. So the other thing, the other thing I want to talk about is, you know, excellence never seeks excuses. So if you say that I would have run well, but there is no but. The but, if there is a but, which means you're trying to put the blame on somebody else. So there is no but. You have to take responsibility of your race, of your action. And if you don't do that, you will not improve because you'll always be blaming somebody else. So in life, if you want to keep seeking excellence, please surround yourself with better people than you. Only people who are insecure will Surround themselves with people who are lesser than them. Get people who are better than you. Surround yourself. In one of my last jobs, I was the CEO of the company. And I was paying my general manager more salary than I drew. And that was because he was really good. So there's no shame in paying somebody more than, more than you. The other thing is that when athletes reach a certain level, or I'm sure in, in life, when you reach a certain level, you don't like criticism. Nobody likes criticism. Everybody wants to be told, oh, you're so great, etc., etc. I think if you want to improve, you must listen to criticism. And this is the biggest, one of the biggest problems with sports people as they reach certain levels. And fans are your biggest enemies. Fans are not your friends. Because fans, what they do is they only tell you what you want to listen. They only tell you that you're great. They can see no wrong in you. So everything that you do is right. I must, I must, I would like to share a personal experience uh, with you. So it was soon after 1980 Olympics. I was national champion many times. I'd won many international medals. I would go to the Olympic Games. I was already holding the Asian record for the 100 meters. Etc. Etc. And I meet this young girl who I was introduced a group of friends, and I was introduced as this great sprinter. So she said, "Who?" And 
like I was completely deflated. I said, what, what do you mean who? I'm Adil Sumari Wala. He said, who? So I said, oh, your general knowledge is so bad. You don't even know who I am, etc. And And we got to know her better. A few years later, we got married. <laughs> And uh, to, till today, she is my best friend and my biggest critic. If she was here, she was here all the way back to Mumbai, two and a half hours, she would be criticizing, analyzing, and telling me everything wrong that I did today. So, 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 but, but therefore, therefore, uh, my, my simple uh, suggestion to, to sportsmen is don't marry a fan. Because you don't want to be married for all the medals that you won. You want to be married uh, for who you are. And uh, so that brings me, that brings me to a saying that we all heard at school, practice makes you perfect. I absolutely don't believe in that. I believe that only perfect practice can make you perfect. So if you're a sprinter and you're running from morning to night, you're not going to become perfect. But if you're a sprinter, you do three sets of six repetitions of 120 meters and do them really well, you'll probably do well. Excellence, again, I believe, lives in the present and not in the past. I hear a lot of our great sportsmen saying, ji, hamare din mein hum ye karte the. You know, that's not excellence. Excellence, and I so strongly believe in it that if you came to my house, I have more than, I don't know, 100 medals, international, national, the Arjuna Award, I don't know how many awards. You won't find a single scrap of that in my house. So, because I don't want to live in the past, what I want to do is, want to live in the future, make the future better, take up new challenges, and you know, keep moving on in life and not reflect on your past and not lived, live in the past. Most of you will study in this great organization, and it will depend on each one of you what you take from it. So grab every opportunity you have and achieve your fullest potential. That's important to achieve your fullest potential. And however, whatever you do in life and whatever you become in the future, just remember and three things that I follow, good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. And the only path, the only path is the path of truth. So thank you once again for inviting me here today. There's just one thing I want to say before I end, that you are the youngsters, you are the future of this country. Keep our beloved Drive Clana flying high. Thank you, God bless.